Barely a year ago, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was completely unknown to the American public. She was, at the time, 28 years old, a former Bernie Sanders organizer who was shaking cocktails and waiting tables at a taco and tequila bar in New York City. And yet it's no exaggeration to say that since then, nobody has made a bigger splash on the American political scene. Since beating powerful incumbent Joe Crowley in a primary race last June and winning election in November, she has become the unquestioned star of the new Democratic majority in the House of Representatives, a charismatic, outspoken progressive who has captured the media's attention and helped redefine what her party stands for and the policies it advances to the public. At the same time, however, she's become the bete noir of Fox News and conservative media, including our hometown newspaper, The New York Post, which she's now encouraging her constituents to boycott. We'll find out why while we explore her views on President Trump, her colleagues in Congress, the future of the Democratic Party, and much more on this episode of Skullduggery. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true. But the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. There will be no lies. We will honor the American people with the truth and nothing else. So, you know, Clyman, we usually start out these shows with a little crosstalk between you and me in which we give our take on the uh, issues of the day or the week. But I have a sneaking suspicion our listeners are going to be more interested in hearing what our guest has to say than anything you and I have to say. Yeah, so, even though we are the sort of the Jesus and Marrow of DC. <laughs> He's not going to get that reference, but, you know, they're fellow podcasters from the Bronx. I have no idea what you're talking about. But anyway, um, so let's get right to it. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, welcome to Skullduggery. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. So, look, there's a lot we want to delve into uh, on the show and get your thoughts on, but uh, in doing a little research... Um, I came across something that um, kind of blew me away, and I didn't know about your background, and that is um, Asteroid 23238 Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> you have your own asteroid named after you, and it was named long before you were a member of Congress. Please explain yeah. how that came about. Uh, well, in high school, my, my first passion and my first love in life, even as a child, is actually... Uh, the sciences. And so um, when I was in high school, I started entering competitive science research competitions. I started leaving school uh, right after school and, and conducting experiments at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, on, on biology and the cellular processes of aging. So I conducted this experiment. I entered the Intel Science uh, and Engineering Fair. I placed second internationally, and as a result of the research, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory uh, dedicated and named an asteroid after me. So is this asteroid visible to anybody who's got a telescope in their backyard and wants to find it? I don't, I've never seen it. <laughs> they sent <laughs> they sent over, uh, they actually, when, when it happened, the laboratory sent over a whole bunch of documents, and they showed... Uh, it's you know they they showed the actual arc on which the asteroid's expected and and where it's plotted to go where it has gone, um, and and all of that. But I'm I actually haven't tried looking for it well, in my backyard. Or, more importantly, I don't have a backyard. But. <laughs> more importantly, is there any danger of this asteroid hitting the Earth? I think it's a little far, so I think we're good. Okay. I mean, metaphorically um, speaking, I guess we could say it already has. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, personified by you. Yeah, and we also. Yeah, that's true. We have an <laughs> asteroid in the White House as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. I think let's moving from the uh, f from the from celestial the cel to <laughs> right down to Earth. Um, uh, and in kind of a sobering way. So on Friday, the president tweeted um, this video attacking your close friend and colleague, um, Representative Elon Omar, for the way she referred to 9-11. Mm -hmm. The quote was uh, not in context, but was to some 9-11, uh, some people did something. Mm -hmm. um, and which some people said uh, minimized 9-11. Uh, she, uh, she went on to talk about how 
the impact that this was going to have on people's civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the, the question is, uh, do you believe uh, that the president um, deliberately, was he deliberately trying to incite violence uh, against, against uh, Ilan Omar and against Muslims more generally? Mm -hmm. I absolutely do. And I think this goes back to especially being a New Yorker. And I think this is where, probably something about the president that maybe a lot of people don't get or understand unless you kind of have that New York context is he acts like, you know, he's one of these shady real estate developer guys that may or may not be involved with the mob. Like that's like the personality <laughs> type that is elicited. Um, and like all New Yorkers know that guy. Like I've bartended for that guy. I have waited tables on for that guy. And the whole style of it is that you do everything. Even Michael Cohen talked about this during his testimony to oversight, is that he doesn't say hurt this person. He doesn't say bribe this person. He doesn't say, um, you know, do X, Y explicit thing. He creates in a, a huge environment of suggestion where if something happens, if that thing that perhaps he may want to happen happens, he's like, hmm, you know, and that's really what's going on. It's creating this pressure cooker. But I, I want to be really clear uh, because there's a difference between kind of using language recklessly that could have those consequences. Mm -hmm. You believe he wants uh, people to uh, act violently. Well, because I think— because that uh, Sarah B. Sar uh, Huckabee Sanders today said that he means her no ill will. Okay, you do not, you do not put that video and air it to twenty five million people, splicing images of the first hijabi woman to be elected to any office in the United States of America when she was elected to the state house in Minnesota. You do not splice together out of context words with images of the planes hitting the Twin Towers and not think that you are trying to incite a stereotype of all Muslims being terrorists. Can you understand why some people would have taken umbrage to the way Congresswoman Omar described the events of 9-11? I can see why people would take umbrage to how her con how that clip was taken and spliced out of context. Now I'm talking about her words, not what the president right, did, but, right. But and what so she said. what I'm saying is that as someone whose words are constantly taken out of context, I could take any four words that you utter in a day and take it out of the sentence and take it out of the context that you uttered them and create outrage around it. I could easily do that. That is why we have to examine what she was actually saying. Some people did something. You know how many times that phrase is uttered about almost anything uh, throughout a day? And then when you look at when you look at the full context of the situation, um, you know, I think it's just I, th I think that it's so clear what she was saying, what sh she was literally talking about in the Muslim community. Uh, and she had referred to terrorism, uh, you know, and she's she's always referred to this. This is not like a persistent issue that she it's not like she struggles mm -hmm. to call the events of that day terrorist acts. And also, I would like to see most of, I would like to see a lot of the legislators on the other side of the aisle uh, legislate in their first language as well as Ilhan legislates in her second. Mm -hmm. So I think this is another layer that people deliberately are omitting from this situation is that Ilhan is a Somali refugee and English, she has commanded and mastered the use of English, but it's also a second language. English is a second language for me too. And so I think that that's an additional layer that's almost being deliberately omitted when we talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Have you spoken to Congresswoman Omar since this happened? I've uh, I've just checked in with her yeah. briefly. I haven't had yeah. like an extended conversation, but I basically said, hey, like if you need anything, let me know. You and know, by the, the way, you, you've been threatened uh, uh, 
as well. I mean, mm-hmm. there was this uh, Ohio College Republican Federation that sent out an email uh, uh, calling you a, a domestic terrorist and mm-hmm. its sub- subject line, other mm-hmm. threats as well. Uh, what's what's that? What's that like? How, how do you cope with that emotionally? Well, I think that I think that what all of this it all has a commonality, which is that Republicans are doing everything that they can to not talk about policy. They're doing everything they can to either create outrage on their own, to try to provoke outrage or to try to dig up something to create outrage because they don't want to talk about the fact that they don't think 9-11 responders should have access to health care for their entire lives. They, they won't, will not support the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. They have no environmental plan. You know, John Kerry came in and they wanted to spend the whole time slamming the Green New Deal as some socialist conspiracy. And John Kerry said, well, what's your plan? They have nothing. But look, the the larger issue that some people see in all this is, you know, we have a polarized political environment in which passions are inflamed on both sides. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, clearly the president has contributed to that. But people on the left have said a lot of inflammatory things as well. Your colleague um, Rashida Tayyib, you know, when she first thing she said in coming to Washington is let's impeach the motherfucker. Yeah. Um, you have said the president is no question a racist. And when you tweeted about the wall, you said the entire premise of a wall, it's based on a racist and non evidence based trope that immigrants are dangerous. So if you're calling Your colleagues, your Republican colleagues who almost universally Mm -hmm. support a border wall, racist Mm -hmm. or at least being motivated by racist thoughts, aren't you contributing to the same sort of inflammatory passions that is plaguing the country? So I think this is a really important conversation for us to have because as a country, we do not know how to talk about race. And the moment anyone uses the word race, racism, or racist, everybody sees red and starts confusing concepts. So I think a border wall is racist. That is- Does everybody who support a, a, a border wall, is are they racist? So that is the jump that the right wants people to make. Because I think that there are certain policies that are absolutely racist. That doesn't mean I I don't always think that a person like do I think everyone who voted for Donald Trump? Do I think all of those people are racist? No, I don't think they're outwardly racist. Inwardly racist? I mean, the people who support a wall, is is that? No, and I think that if you support a wall, it depending on who you are and who what your context is. I don't know your heart. You know, I think that. The president and I think that Fox News are duping a lot well, of people. Well, but in this, you mentioned Fox News in this very highly reductive uh, kind of political media environment. Isn't that why maybe uh, it's you should be careful about um, about language? Mm-hmm. And if you mm-hmm. call a policy racist and and you call the, say the wall is racist. You know at this point, having been through this for a mm-hmm. while, that that's what happens. And well, so maybe maybe the, the better part of caution is just to, to not use that kind of language, which is viewed as incendiary. So I think that this is part of why we struggle so much to talk about race. It's because conversations of race are incendiary, and they shouldn't be. Um, this is why we are not post-World War II Germany, you know? This is why we have not healed. This is why we struggle with concepts like reparations. This is why we struggle to acknowledge the injustices of our past. This is why we act like the civil rights movement was 150 years ago. It's because we have issues talking about it. Do you think we can learn from post-World War II Germany? I think that there's, in some aspects, we can, you know, and and I think that the fact that acknowledging racism is seen and equated with actual bigotry it's like calling calling something that is racist racist is almost more offensive than being racist in america 
and the false equivalence of these. So you want to talk about like racism. If I make that argument, that's actually the basis of a conversation. You could say, well, why do you think this is racist? The reason I think a border wall is racist is because it is based on a racial mythology that has no evidence to back up on it. You know, uh, Donald Trump says there is already a crisis at our border. DHS just issued an assessment in November of last year saying that they couldn't even increase the threat level at the border because there's nothing to facilitate that. So instead, what Donald Trump is doing is that he's stripping all humanitarian aid from Central American countries to create a crisis to force a surge of migrants to come to our southern border so that he can have mm-hmm. this shutdown. But, yeah. but Congressman, woman, there, 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 uh, there is a sharp increase in the number of migrants coming from Central America mm-hmm. to the southern border. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, it was 40, just in the last few months, it was 47,000 in January, jumped to 66,000 February, 92,000 March, and then now expecting mm-hmm. well over 100,000. Right. There are a lot of people coming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I guess the question is what is your, you know, what are your th- views on how that should be handled? Mm-hmm. Do we accept them all? Do we enforce our border, uh, our asylum laws, Mm -hmm. which would require Mm -hmm. denying asylum to a huge chunk of them? Less than 20 percent of those who go through the asylum process end up qualifying Mm -hmm. under our current laws. Well, I think one of our issues is that we are always struggling to treat symptoms because we don't have the political courage to treat the causes. So we don't want to acknowledge our interventionist policies. We don't want to acknowledge sometimes the un- unfair provisions that are slipped into trade agreements. We, you know, like I just mentioned, we are now moving to rescind a very large amount of humanitarian aid that oftentimes helps stabilize regions and prevents those migrations from happening in the first place. So now we're going into, we're, we are, this president in particular is creating and, and aggravating additional crises to create those surges on our border. You know, there's argument over whether we did or did not have a role in regime change in Honduras. And so like there's, there are these conversations that people are happening, but What's happening is that our foreign policies, our trade policies, our economic policies sometimes don't uh, we don't always consider the secondary effects when it comes to migration. Bernie Sanders, um, the candidate you supported in 2016, was asked in Iowa the other day if he Mm -hmm. supported open borders. Mm -hmm. And what he said is what we need is comprehensive immigration reform. If you open the borders, my God, there's a lot of poverty in this world and you're going to have people from all over the world. And I don't think that's something that we can do at this point. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. So that is not my position. Mm -hmm. uh, Open borders. Do you agree with him? Well, I think the position of open borders is a fake position. Do you, do you agree with what Senator Sanders said in that statement? Uh, I mean, I, I guess on it, on its face, I could I I see validity in his statement, absolutely. But I don't think anyone in this that country— That we can't accept every economic migrant trying to come into the country. Well, it it really depends. It I think right now, in this moment, like if we're taking a snapshot of today, we— we definitely need to accept more, even just economically speaking. We're having um, hospitality, even even if you're like, even if you're not me, even if you take corporate lobbyist money, the hospitality lobby right now is lobbying to increase, just lobby to increase the seasonal visa numbers that we're approving and accepting because they can't fill these jobs. There's a lot of jobs that are going unfilled. And so I think to, to a certain extent, um, we need to increase more. Can we accept every single economic migrant in the world? No, because I, I think that what we need to be focusing on are not... Uh, or every single one coming up through Mexico from Central America. We cannot accept them. Well, again, it depends on those numbers. I, I need to see the numbers in front. Right. I need to see what our, what our economic... Uh, what our economic projections and how our economic growth is looking here as opposed and what kinds of jobs we're seeing, what industries are, are growing. But I think it's clear that we we need migrants in this country, just econo- purely economically speaking. Do you still want to abolish ICE? Yes. And yes. replace it with what or nothing at all? No, I think so. I think we need to replace uh 
I think we need to abolish ICE, and we this is part of comprehensive immigration reform because what we have right now with ICE, just and what if anything, what would you, would you do, replace yeah, it with in terms of interior uh, uh, immigration enforcement? Mm-hmm. What would what would the mechanism be? So uh, there are a couple of things. One is that I think that when it comes to immigration enforcement, we need to have mechanisms that are back under control and oversight of DOJ. Because what has happened with ICE, what has happened with a lot of of things that have happened with the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security, and these were the original concerns when George Bush first created, you know, first created the agency, is that there is not enough oversight or accountability. And when you have an agency with the enforcement capacities and an in, and individual detention capacities that ICE has, it's almost a matter of course for there to be some tyrant to take office and for us to to have almost a parallel system. Like these detention mm-hmm. centers are black box centers. CNN is reporting was reporting that kids were getting drugged in these centers. You know, they're forcibly injected with antipsychotic drugs, children. And that wasn't ICE, though. It was the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And so and and so when we have DHS, when you have ICE, when you have CBP, when you have um, HHS, you're able to create this puzzle piece where it's you either have uh, you mess with fungible funds. So you're able to kind of uh, rob from every couch cushion that there is. You're able to. Uh, have discussions like Trump was having, entertain cutting all, cutting the the appropriated funds from Puerto Rico, moving them to ICE. He took six point six billion dollars from the Pentagon and applied it to his wall last year. And now they're asking for an increased defense budget. So I think that that ICE in and of itself poses a unique issue, but it's clearly not the only bad actor and is clearly not the only problem. I do think that uh, ICE in particular is is almost a, a, egregiously lax oversight. And I think that uh, when it comes to enforcement capacities, we need to, if, if you are an enforcement agency, I do think there needs to be a link to DOJ. And I think that there needs to be. A, so, so you're not saying you do not want anybody to enforce the immigration laws in the United States. You're saying it should be under the purview of the Justice Department, I, not Homeland Security. I think we need to change the purview. I, need, I think we need to change what is enforced and how it's enforced. And I think that we need to change our laws as well. And so I do think that I, I well, I will agree with the sta- with the senator on the fact that we do need comprehensive immigration reform. I also think that when a lot of people throw that out there, they don't even know what that means. It just means we need to change it, which I agree with. I agree with, but um, I, I think there's just certain fundamental aspects to our immigration system. Well, so just back to asylum, just for a minute, uh, the what's been happening at the border, I think most people will agree, uh, exposes some of the problems in our asylum system. Mm-hmm. And I think most people agree that there's it's not working the way it should. So specifically, what do you think needs to be done? Uh, what kind of policy changes would you want to make to the asylum system uh, to uh, alleviate some of the problems we're seeing? Well, I think that uh, one of the issues that we have, and it speaks to larger issues with our immigration system, is that it's overly Byzantine. So you have all these different kind of visas with all these different kind of wait times with all these different kind of quota lists, et cetera, and, or different wait times for different countries and different processes depending on what kind of visa you're in. And I think that contributes, A, to a very large amount of wait, wait, mm-hmm. wait times, um, and B, I think it's unnecessary. You know, I have friends, several friends of mine that are here on uh, refugee status or asylee status, one of my good friends, um, a refugee from Venezuela, another a refugee uh, who came on refugee status from Rwanda, and um, you know there, there you you can be in this country as a refugee but not have work permissions, mm-hmm. for example. And so I think that uh, a lot of what needs to get done is to streamline our system, um, but also it's very clear that our court system around around this has huge issues. It's very clear that there are uh, perverse incentives around detention. Um, in no small small part thanks to the fact that we run for-profit detention. And then so once you have a for-profit interest 
behind the incarceration and detention of human beings, then you have a political lobbying issue. And it creates all of these negative pressures for this situation to be a humanitarian crisis. One more question on the on the border issue, and this relates to the president, who uh, was reported this week told the head of Customs and Border Protection that he would pardon him if he faced jail for denying entry to migrants. Um Chairman uh, Jerry Nadler of the House Judiciary Committee said today that this showed the president's contempt for the law and um, that uh, it was uh, for the president to suggest that goal by deliberately seeking to break the law is unforgivable. Um, I assume you agree with him. The question is, what should be the consequences? I mean, I think this this is largely a part of. Uh, largely a question for our leadership. I think it's this is a very grave problem, but there are so many aspects to this presidency that have that have posed a grave problem. Is it and impeachable in your view? I I think you could reach in a bag <laughs> and pull so many things out that are impeachable of this president. I support impeaching this president. Um well, your your colleague uh, uh, Congresswoman Taib is she's introduced a resolution mm-hmm. to impeach. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you s- signed on? Are you we, signing on? We we hadn't signed on um, when it was first introduced, but we probably will. You know, I'm, I'm, you, you we'll, think, we'll take we, a look into you, it. You think you will? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. There's just so many things. Well, from, what would be your top three if you were writing the if you were drafting the articles the, of impeachment the for the three. president? What would be Article One, Two, and Three? Well, I think number one is emoluments. I right. think it's always been emoluments. I think it's always been about that for me. Mm-hmm. Um, two and three? Two and three. Um, I think two would be uh, tax fraud. Mm-hmm. And number three, um, man. I mean, number three, if there's an investigation on this, I think this is pretty potent. As Interesting well. that you don't mention Russia in the top. Three. No, no, I don't. I, because? I think, because I think that um, I think that for a lot of aspects of the Russia investigation, as we saw with the Mueller report, is that a I think there are a lot of parts to the to the Russia issue that comes down to emoluments. It comes down to pay for play, financial transactions, Trump Tower, it, it comes down to money. Um, and if if we had gotten something from the Mueller report, then I then I I would probably put that up there as number one. But um, I feel like it's it's a little risky to put the entire grounds of impeachment, put all your eggs in that basket. Um, and when I think that a lot of this stuff happens through backdoor bank accounts and and -hmm. things like that um so i think emoluments kind of includes any any misconduct financial misconduct uh, and in relation to and specifically on tax fraud uh what do you have in mind is it is there something specific like the uh deflating assets to the insurance issue those issues that you brought up i think in in uh, when you were questioning michael cohen yeah i agree i think it uh it comes to that i mean there's just there's just so much (laughs) (laughs) okay let me ask you the census uh, there's uh, you know i i can't even the the tax bill it's like what can like there's just so much (laughs) uh let's talk a little bit about legislating because Mm -hmm. you came to washington at least in part uh, to pass laws and develop mm-hmm. policies uh, that uh, represent your constituents and the country as a whole. And so I guess the, my first question is, wh- what have you learned since you've been here about that process? Um, and and what specifically, uh, what's your top priority legislatively and what's your timeline for getting it through the House? Well, I think that... Um I think I've learned a lot about political dynamics uh, since since being sworn in, uh, both within the Democratic caucus and the Republican caucus and the interplay of those two. I think that there's more than one way to be bipartisan and that for years we've only exercised one of those two ways. What do you mean? Uh, so, for example, I think the word bipartisan is taken for granted and it 
it feels like almost any time we pass or champion bipartisan legislation, it's done for the advancement of corporate interests or it's done for uh, increasing the military budget. And I think that, for example, in passing the War Powers Resolution, the first one that we've passed in decades to end our in engagement, involvement in Yemen, um, that shows a different kind of bipartisanship uh, where you can, where it doesn't just have to advance one of two very narrow things. I, I think you signed a letter with uh, Rand Paul the other day on mm -hmm. uh, Syria. On Syria. Yeah. Right, calling yeah. for a, a full withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria, which is something President Trump said originally he was mm -hmm. going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I do think that there are there are places where perhaps for very, very different reasons we come to the same conclusions. And, you know, let's just toss out debating which rationale is better if we at least agree on the conclusion then let's um we can save people's lives mm -hmm. you know there mm -hmm. are millions millions of children that are starving in yemen well uh, picking up on this theme you uh, in, an, in an interview at town hall with msnbc with chris hayes he was asking you about the new green deal uh and uh i think that even if the white house uh, the democrats take back the white house congress and the senate mm -hmm. you don't have the votes to get that passed mm -hmm. and i think your response was um you said I'm not, I'm not here necessarily to convince my colleagues. I'm here to go straight to the electorate. Mm -hmm. But so the obvious question is, how do you get things passed without your colleagues? How do you think get things passed without Republican support um, today? Well, I think it's by winning an electorate, you win over my colleagues, you know. Okay, but, but you know, you take universal background checks, for example. Ninety percent of the American people support mm -hmm. universal background checks. Mm -hmm. Congress won't pass that; mm -hmm. hasn't passed it. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's it's challenging. Yeah. So I'm just curious, you know, thinking this through, like, what's your game plan? How are you going to mm -hmm. move the electorate and then well, move your colleagues? Because so, ultimately, you do need votes. Right, right, right. And I do think that there's there are some aspects. So uh, when you talk about my priorities for the next two years. Uh, looking at the pieces on the field, you have a Democratic caucus um, that is uh, very focused on on preserving and expanding a majority in the House. Then we have um, we have a Republican caucus in the House that is just very motivated to obstruct and to make people's lives difficult in every way. Then you have a Republican Senate and you have a Republican president, if you even want to call him Republican. <laughs> I think he kind of like floats out of ideology in some ways. Um, and so, uh, so I feel like a lot of where we can produce on this, uh, what we can produce on, um, I think that job creation infrastructure and green energy is a huge aspect of of uh, there's a huge amount that we can accomplish even given those limitations which is why I introduced a Green New Deal now is the scope ambitious absolutely will we get a, a vote or even a pass on it probably not but I think that by charging forward with that resolution to show what our big picture looks like then we can go after the little things whether it's increased appropriations in renewable energy whether it is uh, whether it is investing more in transitioning our our elevators and mm -hmm. buildings working with uh, working with with uh, union workers and, and labor groups to to attract that infrastructure funding tax cuts for uh, for regenerative agriculture I think that there are it's in those small details that we can accomplish a lot but it needs to add up to a mm -hmm. larger vision are there any Republicans in the house you have a relationship with and believe you can work mm -hmm. with? Yeah, cool. I think there are a decent amount. Um, I and and I think that it is. Um, I I think it's actually kind of funny. I I don't want to risk anyone's career <laughs> sometimes <laughs> by by name. They get yeah, really could, nervous. <laughs> this is the way you could sabotage. Yeah, no, the, exactly. Your, uh, no, uh, if I yeah. if I I think if I really wanted to do damage, I would like endorse Mitch McConnell in his next <laughs> primary. I, um, I don't think that's one of the Republicans <laughs> you have a relationship with. No, definitely not. Yeah. No, I it it is interesting. It is an interesting political dynamic though, because there are Republicans that I have a relationship with. Um, but they're very nervous about people finding out that 
that we can actually work together well, like they're scared of getting primaried. Um, but I, there, there are actually a, a decent amount. And um, I think about one in particular, and the more I talk to talk to him, I'm like, this guy's an anti-capitalist. Like he's against, he's like Ooh. against Walmart and like, like well, corporations. Now we want to know who yeah, he is. Yeah, now you got to give it up. You're, you're teasing yeah. us here. No, no, but the thing is, is, but like that person thinks he's the most capitalist guy in the world, you know, but he hates Walmart and he thinks they're taking all of our jobs and he thinks that, and they hate like the role of special, special interests and how uh, industry is taking over government and like all of these things. But he, in his brain, thinks that he is like the most like free market dude in the universe. What's the, take... what's the, um, so are you following up on that? Cause I had another, Go ahead. I just want to know, you, that, you know, right? na- you've been here in Washington now for how long has it been? How many months? Three, <laughs> four, <laughs> okay. okay. four months. Uh, enough time to make a couple of mistakes. Yeah. Um, so what is the biggest mistake you think you've made since you've been here and the biggest lesson you've learned? I think, um, I'm trying to think of like a, a like more uh, in in a big picture. I do think that our G and D rollout was really difficult, um, and it was done in a way that uh, that it was really easy to hijack the narrative around it. Um, it was like too fast. It just wasn't in some vetted ways. carefully enough. Some of that language well, could be. I think it. Well, I actually think the resolution itself is very solid, um, but. It, you know, between like how it it was rolled out and some of the do- there were like competing documents that were rolled out some prematurely that that muddied the waters and so that everyone was talking about out. cow farts exactly and banning when, hamburgers right when none of those things are are in the resolution itself so that was probably that was a big one because it's it, it was just frustrating mm-hmm. just intensely frustrating um, yeah I mean I, I always feel like when I reflect on things, it's less, I feel like it's less uh, feeling like things are mistakes, but things may be, um, I feel like I'm fine tuning. So like I have to dial things back a little bit to get them clo- to get that, that pressure closer to mm-hmm. where it, it, I want it to be. And it may be too much or maybe too little, but I don't always, I don't feel like I've there was anything major that was like, I really wish I didn't do that. You made a big splash early on by speaking out against Amazon's mm-hmm. deal to put up their headquarters in mm-hmm. Queens. There was a Siena College College poll just this past week that showed 57% of voters in your district thought that Amazon's withdrawal was bad for the city and mm-hmm. 58% thought it would be good for Amazon to reconsider. Mm-hmm. Do you have any reconsidering thoughts on your end about your opposition to a deal that would have brought 25,000 jobs to so, Queens. So here's uh, here's a couple of things on that. One is that, and I said this from the very beginning, where does that 25,000 number come from? Everyone always cites this number and it is almost completely unsubstantiated and it almost feels like it only comes from Amazon that's saying, that's promising this. When you actually look, so what if it was only fifteen thousand jobs? And and so, even then, my opposition was less and and is less about something personal with Amazon, and it's more about the structure of the deal. And uh, when you're looking at three billion, which includes, it's not all tax cuts. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, this thing pays for itself." First of all, revenue neutral. I don't know if revenue neutral is the goal that we need right now. Secondly, um, 25,000 jobs at $150,000 is what was promised. Does that sound like realistic? (laughs) Does that sound like something that's going to happen, first of all? Second of all, do we really think that Amazon is trying to give 150K jobs to kids in NYCHA? You know, third of all, our subway is literally falling apart, literally falling apart. So for me, my opposition um, was less. And by the way, my opposition being like 
five tweets, and apparently five <laughs> tweets took down the richest man in the world. And I'm everything you tweet, yeah, that's uh, right? Is, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, scooped up, yeah. by your three point eight million <laughs> followers. And so I think that uh, I I I don't regret um, opposing it and vocalizing my apprehensions about this deal because it smelled fishy. Now, was it my like, did I think that Amazon was going to say, well, it's our way or the highway. We're not going to negotiate any aspect of this deal. And you're either going to accept what we tell you or we're going to leave. Like, did I think that Amazon was going to try to be try to bully their way into our district? No, I didn't think, you know, I thought that that they perhaps would pursue a reasonable cor- course of action and either there would be some explanation of this deal, some negotiation of some aspects. Perhaps there would be increased expenditures uh, or investments into the district. Perhaps we would create a, a CUNY pipeline to train kids to CUNY uh, coding skills to jobs at Amazon. Perhaps we would be able to get any of those things. And you would, But you would have preferred that than Amazon pulling out. I mean, I, I was open to multiple possibilities. So a- after uh, you spoke out or tweeted out on the issue, Andrew Sorkin, who's a columnist for The New York mm-hmm. Times, financial columnist, wrote, there's a financial literacy epidemic in America. Quick lesson, New York City wasn't handing cash to Amazon. It was an incentive program based on job creation, producing tax revenue. There isn't a $3 billion pile of money that can now be spent on subways or education. Mm-hmm. Well... Again, people weren't reading these this deal. People think that all three billion were in tax cuts. A lot of it was tax cuts. We had five hundred million dollars in capital investments that we were literally giving we were building it was written into the deal that we were going to build a helipad even for Amazon. We were actually putting hard capital into helping them build their campus while we're constantly told that there isn't enough hard capital to heat the rooms in NYCHA last year. I mean, this is a real political issue as well. This is not just, it's not, when you're in, in a position like mine, you have to look at a couple of things. You have to look at the policy. You also have to look at the politics if you to secure that policy. You know, that's what you all were just asking me. This is what you want. How are you going to get it there? And when you look at the actual political landscape of New York City, where we have surging costs of living, a quote unquote affordable apartment uh, in. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm saying NYCHA. It's New York City Housing <laughs> Authority. It's public housing. Sorry. It's, I'm getting into our, our fact checkers jargon. Here, right? yeah, 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 no, I'm getting yeah, into yeah. jargon here. Yeah. Uh, no, but you have you have here are some of like the main political pressures that are happening in New York City right now. Surging cost of housing. And so rent has gone up for like a two bedroom 80 percent by 80 percent in some neighborhoods where people have been living there for 20 years. And uh, and. So you have surging rents, you have um, you you have crumbling public infrastructure. It used to take you forty five minutes to get to work. Now it's taking you an hour and a half, two hours to get to work. And so all of these are about lack. A, it's lack of affordability, and then B, you have lack of investment in public goods, and it's creating a, a, a cost of living crisis and a quality of living crisis. So what we we're talking about is creating more jobs in two boroughs that are already experiencing the highest levels of economic growth. So job creation is already happening in the borough. Um, This is not like a rural area where where we desperately need to hinge our hopes on a Walmart to create jobs because we are already kind of leveraging certain economic policies to to spur economic growth. Where people really need relief is, uh, is in cost of living. It's in their rent. Mm -hmm. And what this threatened to do is displace entire communities and so that's when people are saying like 80 percent of the city was pro amazon or 57 percent of the city was pro amazon until it's in their backyard and so i think that these were some of the issues that we were having to reconcile right so staying on on big tech uh elizabeth warren um a little while ago traveled uh to your backyard um where she announced her policy to break up the the big tech platforms Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, et cetera. Um, so 
and you've been highly critical of, of big tech as well, everything from online harassment to fake news to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, undermining the uh, journalism biz business model. Mm -hmm. Bless you for that. Um, <laughs> I take it, by the way, you don't have an Alexa in your new apartment. I do not. <laughs> I do not. Okay. So I guess the question is, um, what what are your proposals? Do you back mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Warren's plan? Do you have proposals of your of your own? And since you do have such a large uh, social media uh, platform mm -hmm. presence yourself, uh, would you consider, as many Americans have done, um, you know, uh, uh, giving up some of those social accounts just to make the statement? Mm -hmm. Well, I do think um, I do think that a lot of the most pres pressing issues in tech that we're seeing right now has to do with uh, antitrust. And I think that Congress has largely abdicated its responsibility around antitrust, not just in tech, but across a lot of different sectors. And um, and as a result, we're seeing increased problems. And like one of the central parts of Warren's proposal is that these tech companies need to decide what they are. But the fact that you are going to be both the platform and the vendor represents a very large antitrust problem. Um, and the fact that they are consolidating and, and gobbling up 18 different business models into one is a huge issue. And uh, I think that this is also a huge part of a social shift that is happening. Like the political views of young people are very much formed by, uh, you know, I, I think previous generations, like when they talk about democratic socialism, it's like, Everyone's like, it's like the red scare, you know? And uh, I, I have to reiterate to folks that I was born after or right before the Berlin Wall fell. You know, I have never seen, um, I have never seen like a Soviet Russia in my lifetime. That was something in my history book. What I have seen is single payer healthcare systems in Norway and Canada and mm. France. Um, what I have seen are, really innovative uh, housing housing structures and, and housing policies um, in, in Europe as well. And I think that when we talk about tech and antitrust, perhaps older folks are really scared of, that, that saw some of like the horrors um, of going too far in that direction, saw the dangers of government taking over all business and industry. But what we've been raised with is industry and business taking over our government hmm. and oppressing our wages. And in many ways, you check a lot of your civil rights at the door when you go into a workplace. And I think young people, when you see the logical end result of these platforms where they predicate on scale and monopoly power, and then you pair that with our information and you pair that with how information is distributed. I was just thinking this week, like, I was thinking about this, particularly after the president tweeted what he tweeted about Ilhan, um, about how if a lot of people tweeted that, perhaps Twitter would have taken the tweet down mm -hmm. as targeted harassment. Um, but perhaps they don't want to show their hand because they could single-handedly cut the president's power by 30 to 50 percent overnight if they banned President Trump from the platform. You know, that's uh, his bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. you, um, you tweeted the other day um, about a uh, boycott of the New York Post. Mm -hmm. Bodega owners across New York City um, is, are banding together to reject sales of the New York Post that bodegas citywide. And you were endorsing this boycott. Mm -hmm. um, why do you want to boycott one of your hometown newspapers? Well, I don't know what makes it a hometown newspaper, given that it's owned by Murdoch. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the and Washington Post is owned by Bezos in <laughs> Washington State. Yeah. But, yeah. No, but I think um, I think that it. This is a. This is. The New York Post, in being owned by Murdoch, is now, um, you know, it's a it's a toy. He's I think that especially 
Um, but this is because they're being really tough on you. And you well, might, you might want to use a different adjective than tough, but they're going after you they, You know, they, they yeah. are, and it's like whatever. You know, it is. It's, yeah. uh, it can be annoying or agitating, but I didn't call for this when they were going after me. I think that that cover that they had published. What, what cover? Of the so Ilhan Omar. The Ilhan Omar with, cover with yeah. was just beyond the pale. You know, and there's whatever. There's aggressive politics. There's people that won't be fair to you and things like that. And I understand that that's part of the, you know, as part of the field that comes with it. But, you know, I think that this is um, this is unacceptable. And, and also, I think it is important to to assert that I didn't call for a boycott of the New York Post. What I'm am- I'm amplifying um, I'm an- amplifying organizing that's happening on the ground. And I, I do think that there's a substantive well, difference by, by, between by the two. By tweeting about it, you're implicitly yeah. I, I mean, I endorse it. it. I yeah. do endorse it, but I wasn't... I think there's a difference between endorsing this action because I... As what's a, your goal here? Do you want to get them to change their editorial policies? Are you trying to shut them down as a newspaper? What is the purpose of boycotting a newspaper? Well, for me, my perspective is... My focus is actually less, in endorsing it, my focus is less on the post and more on the Yemeni bodega owners and building the power and solidarity of immigrant groups in New York City. Like that to me is what was exciting and inspiring about this action um, because these are the same folks who shut down almost every bodega in New York City uh, in, in, uh, in protest of the Muslim ban. And what that does is that it elevates the consciousness of all New Yorkers. Like, I remember that day. It was before I won my primary. And uh, it was bef- it was like very early. It was like probably around the time when I started running. And I remember getting up and going to my bodega to get a cup of coffee. And it was closed. And there was a sign saying why. And I remember say- thinking and seeing that and being really proud of these people that, um, that I see every day. And sometimes protest isn't about what you're against. It's about what you're for. And that, I think, was the inspiration and impetus. You mentioned uh, uh, earlier the war in Yemen and U.S. withdrawal from uh, Syria. I have one more foreign policy question Mm -hmm. for you that's um, uh, quite current right now. Prime Minister Netanyahu was just Mm -hmm. apparently Mm reelected in Israel right after saying that he intended to an- annex the Jewish settlements on the West Bank. Do you believe this should affect U.S. policy to the state of Israel? I think so. How so? Well, I think these are part of conversations that we're having in our caucus, but um, I, I, I think what we're really seeing is the ascent of authoritarianism across the world. I think that Netanyahu is a Trump-like figure, and I think that we, you know, there are so many ways to, to approach this issue. Uh, Betty McCollum even has a, has a proposal that she's advanced um, asking the U.S. not to fund child detention um, in, in Israel, Israeli child detention of, of Palestinian children. You know, there's, there's different ways to signal it. You know, I, I would hope and wish that a diplomatic approach could could uh, change some and, and impact policy. It doesn't all have to be legislative, but I, I think if we just sit on our hands... Well, should we well, would you, well, Yeah, would you be in favor of reducing military or economic aid to Israel? I mean, I think it's on the table. I think it's not certainly on the table, and I think it's something that, that can be discussed. Um, you know, and I think that there... And I also acknowledge my role in, in this as well, in that I think that that I hope to play a facilitating role in, in this conversation and a supportive role in this conversation. But I also know that there are people that have been leading on this for a long time, like like Congresswoman McCollum. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's important to, but I, I think that we need to expand um, what, what those policy conversations are because I would, as, as just a citizen of this country, I would be very concerned if Trump started really pursuing more and more and more increasingly dangerous policies and ev- everyone just standing ab- aside and say, this is normal, this mm-hmm. is just like before. Yeah. I want to get back to social media for a second and, and actually your social media habits. Um, 
you talked about uh, the social media platforms and children, and of course, uh, you're, you're very present. Uh, I see you particularly on Instagram mm-hmm. because my kids are on Instagram a lot. Um, And you're, I think, an inspiration to a lot of kids. I know my daughters and all their friends are following you religiously. But there's also a dark side uh, Mm -hmm. to social media for uh, for kids. Um, You know, there's this kind of sense of a kind of chronic uh, behavioral addiction um, in our society Um, and a a public health problem. You've got you've got you know, it reduces healthy social interaction. It promotes bullying. It creates uh, so-called FOMO, uh, mm-hmm. fear of missing mm-hmm. out, self-esteem problems, e- even developmental uh, problems. Um, so I guess my question to you is, um, have you thought a lot about this? Um, what do you think should be done about it? Um, and uh, and I guess I want to go back to my question from before. Um, um, have you thought about, at least for mm-hmm. some periods mm-hmm. of time, giving up social media to make a statement? Yeah, there there are some. Um, I personally gave up Facebook. Uh, I actually, which was kind of a big deal because I started my campaign on Facebook. And Facebook was my primary digital organizing tool uh, for a very long time. I, I gave up on it. We still kind of have accounts on it. But the, the kids aren't really on Facebook. Yeah, I guess that's true, too. So I'm, right? I'm doing that <laughs> okay. as well. Um, but, uh, but you know, this I actually think that social media poses a public health risk to everybody. Regardless, I mean, there, there are amplified impacts for young people, particularly children yeah. under the age of three with screen time. But I think it has a lot of effects on older people. I think it has effects of, on everybody, increased isolation, depression, anxiety, um, addiction, uh, escapism. Uh, so I, I think that it, it poses these issues to everyone. Um, I do think about that both as a person with a larger audience, but also just as an individual user of these platforms. I've, I've started to kind of impose little rules on myself. Such as? Um, so every, like every once in a while, you will see me hop on Twitter on the weekends, but for the most part, uh, I take consumption of content like when it comes to consumption and and reading I take the weekends off Um, and so I don't I'm not like scrolling through trying to uh, read everything online uh, that journalists are writing and things like that on weekends I try to do that during during Mm -hmm. the work week Um, or I guess I should say Monday through Friday because I work on weekends too sometimes (laughs) (laughs) Um, and uh, I yeah I I uh, it takes a lot to kind of try to um, unwind other habits. There was a great, there are a couple of great books about this. There was this one book, I'm going to mess up the title. It was basically like a 30-day program to, um, New York Times covered this as well. It's like a 30-day program to change your relationship with your phone. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. Are, are you going to do something about robocalls? Oh, the man. The biggest threat to I wish. American peace, I wish. peace of mind. I mean, but it, it does pose in a technology problem because really the, the reason people are able to get away with all these robocalls is because of these spoofing technologies. So this is another concern that I have, too, is that Congress is fundamentally slow and technology is fundamentally fast, only getting right. faster. And so the problems that can develop in like three months – Right. can be exposed. The, we saw this in the election. By the way, do you write, I, I know you write a lot of tweets, mm-hmm. but do you also have uh, staff write tweets or do you write all your tweets? I write all my tweets. And Instagram posts. Yep, and Instagram right. posts. Wow. And, they, and they seem to be uh, with better grammar and spelling than the president, <laughs> the yeah. other uh, major <laughs> tweeter in, uh, in our public life. Um, so look, we were really impressed with, I think it was one of your first um, questioning in uh, in Congress during congressional hearing when you did the lightning round mm. right it was I think it was campaign finance questions yeah so um, to close this out we've got a lightning round for you okay, so we great. got you know quick uh, we're gonna give you some questions and uh, quick answers okay. okay who's your candidate for president oh I don't I truly do not have one yet Okay. I truly do. I mean, you supported Bernie last time. I did. That, um, that's the second question, man. Uh, that was sorry. Mine. Go. Okay. Go. You were an organizer for Bernie in 2016. Are you with him now? I mean, I'm I'm very supportive of Bernie's run. I I don't officially in like I haven't endorsed anybody, but I'm very supportive of Bernie. I think that 
I also think that what uh, Elizabeth Warren has been bringing to the table is is truly remarkable, truly remarkable and transformational. I'm very supportive of of um, of Bernie too. So. All right, bit of a waffle there. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, could you support Joe Biden? I don't know. Really? I mean, why? Like. I will support whoever the Democratic nominee. So is. you will, whoever the Democratic yeah, nominee is. Yeah, whoever the Democratic nominee is. But you're, de- but you're not ex- excited about a Joe Biden candidacy. I'm. That does not particularly animate me right now. Because I think a lot of issues. Um, one, I think that there's a. You know, I can understand why why people would be excited by that. Um, this idea that we can go back to the good old days with Obama, with Obama's vice president, and I think you know there's there's a there's an emotional element to that. But I I don't want to go back. I want to go forward. Uh, do you want to run for higher office? I don't know. I really don't know. I you know I th- I think about it every once in a while, but um, a this is pretty hard already. <laughs> Um, You're doing pretty well. Thanks. Um, when you think about it, what what are you thinking? I mean, I just I just want to be useful. <laughs> I just want to be most yeah. useful, and I'm not trying to kind of impose some personal ambition. I think that if a, a window opens and I feel like I can do well and do better um, and offer more to people then I, I would consider it. But I also, I don't have like a 10-year plan or a right. five-year plan or anything. Right. I, I got the last one, but you want one before, right? Uh, well, actually, uh, two really quick ones and then you okay. go. Okay, all right. Uh, what are you reading uh, and what book has had the sort of biggest impact on your politics and your outlook on life? I, um, I've i been reading Rebecca Solnit's uh, small book, Hope in the Dark, and I really love it because, you know, I think what we saw in 08 was, you know, the hopey, changey stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that book, which is kind of like this larger essay that she wrote actually around Iraq and Afghanistan, um, around our involvement there. Uh, it's like it, it breaks down hope as a political tool, why hope is pot- potent and how it can drive change and the ways that we can actually have hope about our future in a in a very tangible way, hmm. taking lessons from history, policy, et cetera. And uh, I feel like I'm learning a lot about how we can uh, build support around any number of issues from from that essay and from that book. So cool. Okay, now one, one last question for me, and then he's got the last one. Um, okay, I understand that you're a, a Game of Thrones mm-hmm. fan. Okay. So the last season goes on air uh, just a few hours from this yeah. taping. Who's going to end up on the Iron Throne? Who's going to win the Game of Thrones? Could you imagine if no one ends up on the throne and they transition to democracy? <laughs> <laughs> like, wouldn't that a, be bad? That answer? is such a skillful answer. <laughs> <laughs> but All is right. that that's your hope? What is your expectation? Um, I mean... Another hope would be it would be like maybe uh, Jon Snow and Daenerys just take the whole thing and they build another one, build a second one, yeah. Okay, last one. And I'm told you've been ducking this one for what? some time. <laughs> oh, so gosh. no dodging on this one. You have a district that includes the Bronx and oh, Queens, man. Yankees or Mets. I'm in trouble. Okay, so here you go. You guys are breaking news. I have been raised a Yankees fan through and through however this is a huge feud in my family because a big part of the bronx side of my family are also mets fans and and city fields in my district so in some ways i have to kind of learn to be a mets fan too but i'm primarily a Yes, right. you got three. Right. You got three Yankees the- fans yeah. in this room already <laughs> yeah, with yeah. Anthony. Yeah. Um, Although or- I'm, 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 you know, I live in Washington. I have a nine-year-old. I'm a big Nets fan too. Oh, man. But, you know, so. and when I was a kid too, yeah. like yeah. I grew up with that Yankees dream team, like Jeter, Posada, like yeah. Mariano Rivera, like excellent. Like you can't not when right, that's so how you grow up too. Whenever the Yankees comes up, I always have to give him a hard time and say, "This mm-hmm. guy actually saw Mickey Mantle 
That's play. epic, play. though. Play. So I'm hit a home run. That's in incredible. Yes. All right. So uh, some News. deference. Some deference, Clydeman. Some deference. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Congresswoman. This was a great discussion, oh, and uh, we hope to have you back. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for joining us on this episode of Skullduggery. Don't forget to subscribe to Skullduggery on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And tell us what you think. Leave a review. The latest episode is also on SiriusXM on the weekend. Check it out on POTUS Channel 124 on Saturdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time with replays on Sundays at 1 a.m. and 3 p.m. Be sure to follow us on social media at Skullduggery Pod. And now you can watch the podcast on YahooNews.com, YouTube, and Roku. Saturdays and Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Talk to you soon.